I was giving an introduction about uh, the Internet of Things, and uh, you know, maybe you could so you could tell us about uh, you know what is IoT in theory and sort of uh, you know how does it uh, uh, how does it work. Hello. Yeah, Ram, am I audible? Uh, I don't know if it's yours or mine, but it's kind of uh, the connection is a little shaky. So I don't if if you can hear me, just let me know. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I I can actually hear you. Yes. Okay, all right. Okay. Uh, firstly, thank you so much for having me here, and uh, I really appreciate it. And um, and I could see lots of young coders and lots of people who are taking interest in. learning computer science learning uh, programs and also learning programmatic languages to understand and build things and uh, and especially the topic of internet of things is like as as you rightly pointed out in the introduction itself internet of things is everywhere right from uh, your smart gadgets or, or or probably the wearables what you wear on your wrist that is like your smart uh, smart watches so on and so forth uh, so what is the definition of internet of things uh, to simply put together anything which which is connected via internet where you could get some meaningful information out of it it could be it could be your smart watch itself which is reading some uh, sensory data that is like uh, there are sensors in that smart watch which are reading your blood pressure and then it's sending it over to cloud and on your app you're able to see that. that 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 just that just simply defines that that is an internet of thing how does it work is uh, it's a complex thing it depends on what kind of sensor what kind of uh, device are you are you using but to put simply in a very simple words is that you have a bunch of devices or bunch of sensors and all of them are connected via controller or probably via a processor what we call them as and these processors are talking everywhere it could be talking to your own phone on your app or it is it, it could be talking to the cloud which means that it is sending data over a cloud and then you're collecting the data and all these comes and falls under internet of things internet of things is the, nothing but what if if all the objects we know all the devices what we know are started talking to each other and they are also making sense to us it's just not that they cannot talk they can talk obviously and uh, they make sense out of it and that's exactly what internet of things is and there are lots of uh, lots of things right like the sensory data the weather information uh, at this point in time during the day is when the rain starts falling right and how could they predict up to that that hour or that minute is something coming from weather sensors which are which are located across the globe and also on the satellites you know so that that way these the, the collection of all this information and making it more meaningful and then uh, publishing it across for all the day to day usages or probably your own personal usages is what we call as a connected device and that is where the internet of things come into the got it so like uh, if 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 uh, you know anyone wants to know conceptually or uh, uh, if they want to build iot products or iot services what are the technologies or concepts that uh, you know somebody should be aware of uh, so uh, so as i was just setting the context of just give, defining what is internet of things uh, there, there are multiple things like if you see uh, there is an object or probably there is a device or a sensor and what we typically call them as like uh, the sensors or the devices or in computer terms we call them as firmware or those are those are hardware devices or something which is physical which is like an object and it has some amount of information which it captures it could be the light sensitivity it could be your uh, pulse sensitivity which is like a pulse oximeter on your uh, watch or or it could be as simple as uh, sensing uh, when are your veg vegetables in your fridge getting rotten So, so all this depends on uh, the kind of sensor. So there is, there is, if you broadly divide it into, there is something which sits and acts on top of these devices. That is your hardware. That is your. It could be your sensors. It could be your hardware devices, chips, so on and so forth. And then there is all that which takes to retrieve the data and then push it to wherever you want, whether it could be apps or web and all. what happens is that when the data is being sent right for example uh, a lights uh, light sensor is sending you data it could send in the data uh, in a different format it could it could send just like uh, temperature variances and all but that could not be probably read by uh, someone like human right so it you need machines to understand what is the data being sent how is the data being sent at different frequencies or different intervals of time what we call them as so you your programmatic challenges starts from there how to read the data and how to 
uh, like uh, understand the data and then just start pushing the data. So if I, if I just look at how to read the data and understand the data, uh, majority of this uh, IoT problems are like, like you get lots of bytes of information and all the bytes of information has to be converted into something very, very meaningful. And uh, there are languages like C, C++, uh, Python, uh, even Java. They are, they are quite familiar out there in the market. And all of them have a decent amount of examples online. And that is probably the, the, the place where people get started. With. That is where you, uh, because out of the box, they give you solutions which can let you connect to your own device uh, and read the data and then, then make some useful information out of it. And that is where uh, typically you get started with. See, there is also other side of it, which I said, right? Like the devices have their own firmware, what we call them as, which is firmware is nothing but a software which runs on some hardware. And it has its own cycles of sensor. So that could be very, very, it could be proprietary also based on who's making the sensors. So for example, if, if an Apple making a chips or sensors, they would not, they would, pay, they would patent it and they would not let you uh, write something on it, but they could give you some interfaces to write on top of it. So that way, this, this is how it is divided. So if you know the basics like uh, C, C++, uh, or probably something like a Python or a Java, you could, you might as well get started with it, and you will be able to definitely write something which is meaningful and read the data from there. Got it. So I mean, uh, fundamentally, it's all about uh, how uh, there are sensors in the hardware or firmware device, and then uh, streams of data is sent from that thing, um, and then computer science engineers are mostly working on how to infer that data to basically provide some amount of valuable information, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah, but I think I think now how it is separate. Yeah, I, I think also nowadays uh, there's a lot of things like uh, uh, IoT is being clubbed with image processing. IoT is being clubbed with AI, and IoT is being clubbed with a lot of other technologies as well, right? Uh, um, so IoT is uh, like uh, typically what we call them as that. As I said, the breakdown of uh, IoT happens. The collection of data is the biggest thing, right? Uh, these sensors, mm -hmm. devices, send huge amount of information. If I leave a sensor on, like for example, if I leave my heart rate monitor on, it, it checks heart rate throughout the day for 24 hours interval. So that's like huge amount of information. And that mm -hmm. information for you to understand the process, you need technologies, you need probably tools and technologies to collect that data and process the data. And that is where majority of the computer science problems are getting in it. You, you, you would have heard about artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, kind of uh, like technologies or tools and uh, this is where uh, uh, the world is going towards uh, to help iot uh, get that kind of a stack got it so so ram if uh, you know uh, maybe you could tell us about a bit about how iot is going to affect our day to day lives uh, you know today mm -hmm. and uh, in the future yeah ram you're audible Hello. Yeah. Hey, sorry, I, I lost my connection. <laughs> sorry, my, no problem. My IoT is failing. I'm really sorry for that. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Yeah. So, Ram, uh, maybe you could tell us a bit about uh, how IoT is going to affect our daily lives. You know, uh, uh, today, tomorrow, in the future, how IoT is going to play a role in our daily lives. Oh, well. So uh, let's let's take a few examples uh, where IOTs are really there. And majority of the people would think that okay, IOTs is just like a fancy term and it's not been used. But if you, if you look at industries or agriculture, right, it had been in so much of prominence for the last 15, 20 years or, or further long, right? Uh, leave what even in India, it is coming and it is coming at a very, very rapid pace. If I take industries as an example, and if I look at machines, majority of the machine, they say that my machine is automated. What is automated means that there is very, very less or no human interaction is what we call it as an automation. It means that if my machine is pressing something or if I have a machine which presses uh, some molds or makes it into some shape, right? I don't want humans to see that if the shape is coming exactly what I've defined it, right? So that is where the sensors come into the picture or what we call them as IoT. Uh, when, when I connect these multiple devices or these sensors, and I'm, I'm as a human sitting at somewhere in my control room and able to see if my machine is doing the right job 
how many it is doing uh, that is where it has been so this is about the past and lots of automation if you see the all the robotics around it how does a robot know that if you, if you go to a manufacturing company like a toyota or someone like a, like a tata steel you know right majority mm -hmm. of them use lots of robotic automations they have lots of sensors they could they could have infrared sensors they could have temperature sensors they could have shape they, they define the shape so they look at the infrared draw a diagram uh, draw get all the sensor data and actually put a diagram around it and say that okay this is how my shape is coming right? mm -hmm. or, or when the machine is running right so that way in the past it had been always been there and and majority of the newer use cases are coming towards agriculture and if you see mm -hmm. agriculture is like a very very like it, just just leave india for a, for a second and let's go outside india there'll be there'll be like hundreds and thousands of hectares of land and uh, labor is super super expensive and for there uh, if i want to really look at my 100000 hectares of land and how do i know that if my it's it's ready to uh, like uh, is is this a harvesting time is it like too much rain or is is the water really getting supplied over there is where they started majority of the automation and that is where uh, uh, ge and all these companies have come into the picture and have helped them build all those tools so for example one of the one of the major things which uh, even in india which started happening is the drones so drone has an attached camera it has like sensors you can put sensors camera almost like a human eye so it has cameras which is equivalent to an eye and then it has sensors which can sense any information on top of it right so basically basing all these things if a drone goes into an agriculture land and gets to collect all the information and that information comes back to you and and you sit somewhere else you don't sit very close to the uh, like you, you don't sit very close to the farm but you, you sit uh, like um, somewhere else but collect but collect all that information and then understand that information is what uh, like today's use cases are getting into right so the drones play a huge role like uh, if there are rotten or if there are rats in your uh, farm and they're moving in the night and uh, mm -hmm. it's humanly impossible for you to go throughout the like uh, what do you say uh, the farm and get to see where where are, where are the snakes where are the rats right it's it's impossible but you could still put place some sensors and find if uh, like if some movement is happening and if you look at the movement and what is the object which is moving it is collected back and it could send something like hey something is moving within my farm and i'm able to get that information so that is the applicability of today because that is where i see uh, especially in india like countries like india where uh, iot could help farming quite very mm -hmm. well and uh, especially all these farmers who are under uh, like a uh, lots of pressure, especially be uh, because of these uh, issues with uh, weather, issues with the uh, temperature or whatever, right? So, and they could really uh, like uh, make most out of it. So that is where uh, uh, the IoT is really, really helping. And futuristically, if I look into, uh, there are lots of home innovations which are coming in, like your webcam, your CC cameras, which can capture mm -hmm. any movement, and also like your robotic vacuums is one of the highlighted things what you're looking into. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, that, that was an interesting thing because uh, while you're purchasing robotic uh, vacuums which help you clean your house on a day-to-day -day basis uh, all the robotic vacuums uh, what you have seen until now were uh, circulars mm -hmm. and now someone came saying that okay the circulars is not collecting information what they wanted uh, you have to actually have a sphere you don't need to have a circle so that you can go and collect all the information from the edges so what it does is it goes to the edges or goes throughout your rooms, your corridors, everywhere, and collects that information as data points. Mm -hmm. And then your program is actually making all the rectangles or squares and saying that these are your areas, these are your, this is your hall, this is this is where your uh, what do you say like balcony is there, or probably this is where your porch is. So that way the innovation, uh, what I see is that there are lots of innovation which is which could definitely come into our private lives per se or personal lives per se but the majority of the application would be on the public side of things that is mm -hmm. that is helping your community helping your like um, major use case like your agriculture or your community mm -hmm. so on and so mm -hmm. forth is where i see iot really playing a major role and that mm -hmm. is where like um, simple things like i want to use uh, a card where i don't want to uh, go and swipe something where I can just still put my card in my pocket and some RFID reader or something reads it and tells me that, okay, there's a RAM and he can enter into a metro. So mm -hmm. like something like uh, like public transport, something into agriculture, something into uh, 
uh, basic governance, like you have webcams and you can, you can also find out if people are, are under stress. One of the most innovative things what I've seen off lately is that in hospitals, they started using infrared uh, thermometers, mm -hmm. even in airports now, especially during this uh, unfortunate pandemic thing, where they could actually sense uh, uh, like your temperature at certain point on your body. Mm -hmm. So those infrared, irrespective of what height you were, they were able to uh, like use infrared uh, like uh, thermometers, which are placed at the at the entrance of the hospitals or the airport, to actually uh, like uh, sense temperature from your head or from your uh, the upper body. So that that that's that's uh, that's a great innovation right? because this is absolutely new. you could not have people go and take temperature from very close proximity, and you cannot really build structures to people uh, stay. Uh, like behind a glass and then take temperatures, right? So now that way, the innovations are like many. Uh, mm -hmm. But what happens is that, at least in the future, the innovation should help the community, should help us, should help uh, like uh, the public to build, uh, something to help public, something to help communities like agriculture, industries and all, is where majority of this happens. Because industrial automation is like a huge thing. And lots of, con like every industry or every company uh, spends billions of dollars on just the automation, and that is where IoT plays a uh, huge or an important role. Got it, got it. And I think I think you know everyone here. Uh, if you have any questions, we are actually taking questions in the Q and A section. And uh, any questions you guys can actually drop in questions, and then um, if if it gets enough upvotes uh, or if we feel that it's interesting, we'll obviously pick it up and talk about it with Ram. Uh, so yeah, I, I think Ram, I think that that was uh, a very good insight. You know, I think uh, farming. Um, uh, you know, is obviously widely popular in developed countries where, like you mentioned, their labor cost is heavy. And uh, now a lot of people are talking about automated farming. And uh, I think that's very true where uh, they put sensors and automated watering for plants, automated lighting for plants and automated detection for harvesting and right. even automated harvesting. And um, yeah, I think even in healthcare, I think like you mentioned, healthcare is also uh, leveraging IoT a lot. Uh, I think it started with uh, some basic monitoring of health systems, but now uh, a lot of people are building products where, uh, uh, you know, you actually get real-time monitoring uh, on your phone itself. And I think all of these uh, it, great yeah, innovations. Apple, Apple Watch is quite famous, right? They're taking the ECG yeah. and they, they're, they're finding that, uh, like, uh, uh, like your heart rate. And they yeah. can actually, uh, that, that, that's also the innovation, right? As small as a watch and inside the watch, you're having uh, sensors place, which, are, which mm -hmm. is kind of taking ECGs. Mm -hmm. It's not that, by the way, uh, it's not that there's an ECG machine which is sitting in there or the sensors mm -hmm. are powerful. The sensors are seen across mm -hmm. the industry. There is no, no difference. No. It's just mm -hmm. the, the way uh, programmatically Apple developers have developed that code and were mm -hmm. able to get so much of information, make meaningful insights of the information is what is, so what mm -hmm. is something we have to highlight for ourselves. Because now we are talking more in terms of what you say, uh, programmatic or how computer science would help or probably some programming would help it. Is that how well they were able to capture the data and how well mm -hmm. they were able to give up meaningful information that particular people or the, those people saying, hey, you have some like uh, like uh, variances in your ECG. That is that is the most innovative part, what it means. Got it. Um, I think we got a very interesting question, right? So uh, uh, one of the participants asked, uh, how does a computer convert real things such as pressure, temperature, et cetera, into binary uh, binary things like one or zero so the computer can understand the data yeah uh, <laughs> I, I thought of not uh, like when I, was, when I was answering that iot initially i thought of telling you bytes of data and then then converting into like ones and zeros actually that that is a, that's a that's a very good question by the way that is exactly what i wanted to say but i made it quite generic uh, to everyone to understand and i'm really sorry for that, but thanks mm -hmm. for, for that one. yes absolutely right the sensors mm -hmm. actually sends data uh, because uh, the sensors could be anything, right? It could be a temperature sensor, it could be a light sensor or infrared. Infrared is, you can use infrared sensors to understand the depth, the length, width, height, so on and so forth, right? So all this information which it comes in, they're absolutely like binaries. Like each mm -hmm. of the data comes in, either, either they come in binaries or they come in uh, bytes of information. Mm -hmm. The bytes of information or binaries one and zeros, when it comes from a particular sensor, for example, uh, let's look at uh, infrared sensor and it is it is giving me four dimensions. It is giving me the length, breadth, width and height. And also it's giving me the fifth dimension, which is like uh, uh, not a dimension, but it's a calculated value called as a depth. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, you, you can look at, I have a four wheeler and I have a, at, at the back of my car, I have these sensors, which is, which is 
uh, like um, telling me about how close I'm to that object. Now this data is being sent continuously and all these four parameters or four variables, what we call them as, are sending some binary information to me at, a, at some rate. So what happens is that whenever I read, so what these sensors are typically made of is that when we actually uh, go and install the sensors and when we calibrate what we call them as the sensors, calibration is nothing but these are my different variables what I'm collecting. These are the possible values for that is what we calibrate with. So when, we, when I calibrate and I got all the binary data, I know all the variables and I know all the binary data what I'm getting there. Based on that, or, or probably not just the binary data, it could be also actual data which is coming in bytes of information, right? So I can read the data based on that variable which, is, which the sensor is set for, and I'm reading the data, and then I'm translating that into very meaningful information for something like a car to tell that, hey, you're very close to an object. Mm -hmm. so binary is not, see binary, uh, so for example, um, um, a good use case of binary is uh, something like, right? Uh, I am turning my car, and I have turned on my indicator. It means that my indicator position is now one. And as soon as I turn my car and I come back to a, a like straight line or probably a straightish kind of line where my steering wheel is coming back to its kind of original position. When, I, when it changes a little bit of angle, I know that um, my angle is, for example, it went up to 90 degrees or like 180 degrees and it's coming back to around 90 or like something like that, a little higher than uh, the actual uh, position of turn, then I can I can send that information and auto cut off my indicator. So that binary is one zero now. So it, it need not be binary all this. It could be uh, frequencies of data. It could be at 60 hertz, 90 hertz, 120 hertz, like higher frequencies of data, or it could be uh, like a temperature reading, which again comes in a different uh, parameter. But all this information is what uh, you have to process. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, the major thing is that the devices are here and the devices are sending all this information. This is where your IoT uh, programming would start. So it's, here is your device and here is where you are. And this is what we call typically as IoT gateways. Gateway mm -hmm. is nothing but I'm, I'm reading information from all my IoT devices onto a central platform. And this platform is where you start building your applications. Got it. Awesome. Awesome, Ram. So, like, uh, you know, uh, could you tell us like a little bit about how uh, you know Ather is sort of leveraging IoT? Uh, some cool things which Ather did using IoT. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and, uh, obviously, because since I work for I, Ather, and I just definitely want to bring it out. Uh, Ather by currently has about forty to forty-five sensors, and these sensors send multiple different information. Uh, think about uh, thinking of uh, the most common sensors. What everyone knows in an EV is your battery and, and the health of the battery. That is like a battery composes of multiple different cells packed together. That's the reason it's called as a battery pack, which, which sits in, inside an EV. Just not ether use case, but just look at an EV use case in this case. That battery pack has multiple different cells and there are, there are sensors which are placed on top of this battery pack to sense which of these cells are actually uh, going high in temperature or which of these cells are degrading faster than anyone else, or which of these cells are taking more time to charge than any other cell? So that is that is probably one of the coolest things what you get out of uh, uh, this sensory data. And Ather also like uh, no exception in that case. We have a battery management system which actually sits on top of this entire battery pack and gets to read all this information and send it back to the rider who's riding the bike on the dashboard saying that, hey, looks like your battery is heating up. Or it could it could just simply say that, hey, looks like your charging is taking more time than it usually takes. So I'm raising a ticket for you and you can go and visit the service center tomorrow. So the entire thing has been automated. So basically we don't wait for the customers to come to us and say that, hey, there's, there's something wrong. But we also get that kind of an information which obviously the, the customers also agree for that Okay, you can. You, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm okay to send this kind of a data. Uh, and uh, one of the other coolest things, probably, uh, what we have done is that uh, uh, we have introduced the auto indicator off on a bike. Mm -hmm. Auto indicator off is like more of a uh, like four wheeler, six wheeler, uh, all, all the all the light motor vehicles and the heavy motor vehicles, right? But we have mm -hmm. introduced that in on a bike. On a bike, steering is not like it will come back to its original position. It's impossible. It's, it's all human done. But we could we could actually get that data 
by the the rider's position uh, or the wheel, the way the way the wheel had turned out with the wheel, the way the balance has changed. So typically, what happens is that when you take turns on a bike, your balance shifts. It's mm -hmm. not in the it's it's not probably uh, towards the center. Probably it could it could uh, go towards the left or towards the right or whatever, right? And be, and all this information is captured by a sensor, and all these sensors make that useful information. When you when you turn on an indicator, when you take a turn, and when you after you take a turn and you go straight in a straight line, the indicator actually turns off after a certain amount of time or certain interval of time. So there is there is no need for you to again go and uh, like uh, click on the switch to get it back to uh, like cut off the ignition and uh, that's how uh, that that's one of the probably the coolest thing what we have uh, done the auto indicator out. and there are multiple different things like that we have done we have like uh, 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 like if you go to Ather's uh, experience centers and you take a test ride mm -hmm. the entire test ride will be visualized on a 3D graphic. And that graphic oh. actually tells you how you are sitting on the bike, how you are tilting the bike, how did you fix your bike, uh, like uh, the the brakes on the bike, so on and so forth. And all this is again coming from those sensors or the IoT device or the, the different IoT sensors which are there inside the bike. And, and these are few few of the coolest things what we had, done. and there are lots of them. But uh, probably uh, I'll take a different forum to explain that. <laughs> awesome. So I mean, I think I think uh, you know, our automotive industry is obviously an area of interest. So could you maybe tell us a bit a bit more about how automotive industry is uh, sort of uh, going to use IoT probably in the future, or how? Uh, probably some uh, some luxury brands or uh, some big brands are actually using IoT currently uh, for their cars or vehicles. So uh, uh, everyone started adapting into these sensors, right? Uh, like mm -hmm. as I said, the engine sensor, the, the hot, the hot and cold kind of sensor where I can turn it on and off. And your uh, rain, I'm sorry, uh, rain sensors is one of your major things, right? Automatic wipers. Mm -hmm. How do how do they work? They are sensing actually uh, like. Uh, uh, the rain and they're uh, turning on the uh, your uh, what do you say uh, your wipers on. So there are there are so many things like that which have come into the picture. Uh, probably the coolest things is that um, what I've seen off lately, which everyone is uh, getting into the uh, uh, area, is that your uh, autonomous driving assistance systems or ADAS it's called as. Mm -hmm. And there are few cars which in India which are ADAS level one certified, level two certified, and all. Autonomous driving, so like Tesla is known for their autonomous driving, like uh, mm -hmm. even hands-free driving, Tesla drives, mm -hmm. right? And it's happening because of these these different devices which are there, which on mm -hmm. on the vehicle. Like it mm -hmm. could be your infrared sensors, it could be your uh, like uh, your cameras which are installed, and all these are connected to the, the central processing unit, which we call it as like a controller, or or, a, or in this case like a tablet which sits inside the vehicle, collects this information, and then processes this information either to break or to avoid pedestrians or probably uh, avoid collisions, put you in a lane. So when you're changing the lanes, right, and if you, if you see something coming left side, when, you, when you're on the right-hand right, on the left side is your blind spot. So behind you is your blind spot. A line, it's called lane assist, by the way. Lane assist is mm -hmm. nothing but it actually uh, like blinks a small light mm -hmm. on your left mirror, telling you that, hey, someone is very close to you on your left side. So if you're taking a left turn, just be aware that someone is next to you. Mm -hmm. So that kind of innovations are a lot of them are there. Like, uh, like uh, one of the coolest things what my car has is that when when I'm reversing the car and if I don't see the object, it actually breaks. Mm -hmm. I don't give the brake input. Like uh, mm -hmm. there, there is also uh, which is uh, there there is also quite a famous thing around the cars uh, that is the. Auto park assist, it's called as. Mm -hmm. So actually, I can go into a parallel parking without me doing it. Mm -hmm. I just turn on my sensors and say that, hey, is this the right slot? It actually, you have to activate the sensors. Mm -hmm. Then the car finds the slot where it can take a, a like a, a parallel parking and put your car there. And that is that's all because of all the real time processing which is happening and reading all this data uh, from your camera, your sensors. Your proximity sensor, so on and so forth. So, an automotive industry is like um, probably uh, a way to go in that sense. Uh, there are there are also things like uh, your fatigue when you are riding uh, when you when you are driving your uh, vehicle. Right? There are also uh, like sensors which are put in or cameras put in to understand how much fatigue you are going through when you are uh, driving the vehicle. Uh, automotive industry is definitely gearing up for that, and there are lots of connected tech, connected devices coming in the direction. Got it. Cool. I think, yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, a lot of large companies actually started adoption. And uh, I think 
I think it's a matter of cost, right? I think once the cost start reducing, and then it'll start appearing in uh, a lot of other cars as well. Um, awesome. So I think Ram, I think we also got another interesting question uh, asked by uh, one of the attendees. So it is it is about security issues. I think mm-hmm. security, privacy issues uh, is again uh, a major problem in IoT. So one of them asked that how can we achieve a security in IoT and how do we ensure that there are no security flaws or threats because of IoT? Your IoT will not uh, have any security issues provided. The sensors are just sending, sensing the data. Your program will definitely have the security issues. Mm-hmm. Like uh, where it starts from is, for example, if I'm putting it, it inside a, a machine and the machine mm-hmm. I'm connecting it to my own uh, router or through, mm-hmm. a, through a system I'm able to connect it or send that information to the cloud. Right? And that is where your majority of security comes into picture. Uh, mm-hmm. what, Typically, we do is that we go for the certification, especially in automotive industry. It's mandatory. Like, like I said, right? It has mm-hmm. one data certification which you have to get. Like, for example, if I'm using Bluetooth and if I want to read all the data and send it via Bluetooth, I have to get SIG certification, which is like mandatory. Mm-hmm. FCC certification is also one of the things. So, there are lots of uh, government norms. There are lots of things, especially coming from a hardware standpoint, because your IoT centers are again hardware right? and converting into software to read that information, all that has to get certified. Apart from that, uh, the major areas where you might start looking into is that, uh, why are you sending the data? How are you sending the data? Are the two areas where you will start looking into securing it. One, you are sending this data only to correct information, mm-hmm. then it's fine. But how mm-hmm. you're sending it is very, very important. If you're using something like a, uh, like for example, if you are reading it only for your own self or your own mm-hmm. company or industry purpose, and you have very, very secure connections over there, then you might have to implement something called a hardware security module, what we call mm-hmm. it. That is called, that's, a, that's a software term, by the way. Hardware security module is nothing but a device which comes with some encryption keys. Mm-hmm. It's inside this hardware, uh, like for example, as I said, right, uh, like IoT sensors, machine, wherever it is, then there is a controller, which is like a gateway. You know? Then hardware security module is also embedded into these gateways. So now you have to enable that hardware security module and uh, what it does is it it encrypts all the data which is within that uh, device or that machine or whatever it is, whatever the control it is and sends the data from upwards. The way it works is that we actually lock the entire device using that hardware security module and once it's locked, uh, there is no way to unlock it. So it means that once you, once you uh, encrypt it, there is no way to decrypt. Got it. So it, it is sort of like your normal application itself. Yeah. Encryption for privacy, right? Yeah, encryption for privacy. and uh, But here encryption also follows these uh, stringent certifications. Mm-hmm. So it's not that uh, like uh, like on the cloud, right? I can take a mobile app and just build something. I really don't, no one asks me for encryption. Until mm-hmm. unless I'm a financial institution, then then people might start asking me for PCIDS is compliance. But when you took when you look into hardware of these IoT devices and then you're reading data from there, all mm-hmm. of them have to go through some amount of certification. Without which they will not be allowed. Like for example, any smartwatch what you're wearing, right? It has mm-hmm. to have the Bluetooth for connectivity. They have to get SIG certified. Mm-hmm. So that okay. clearly looks at how you are sending the data, how you are retrieving the data. Mm-hmm. But anyways, a good practice is that uh, it's important to uh, secure the data. There are lots of encryption algorithms which are available. Apart from that, there are also people like uh, HSM, that is a hardware security module providers, which uh, you should understand or properly leverage or use something like um, uh, like encryp- the known best known uh, encryption algorithms to encrypt the entire data when it's in transit. The most important part is your source and destination, so is your device and destinations, your cloud or could be your app or something. The entire data between the source and the destination has to be encrypted. And that is where the security Got it. Cool. Awesome, Ram. I think, uh, you know, uh, in terms of innovation in IoT, right? Um, I think a lot of innovative products are coming in. Uh, like I mentioned, like IoT merged with AI or IoT merged with, uh, uh, you know, video processing. Uh, now, we're hearing a lot about uh, doorbells, which are sort of integrated with IoT cameras which you can access through your phones and that you can get live streams on your phone. So there are so many innovative products which are coming out. So, you know, could you tell us a bit about some, some really cool innovative products which have come out in IoT or which probably will 
uh, come out in some space in IoT in the future or in the coming days? Uh, like home automation is like a big thing uh, outside mm-hmm. India. Home automation is like a huge thing. Lots of people outside India uh, mm-hmm. take all the insurance for the homes and on, and they also install all these home automations, like the, the doorbell IoT cameras. Mm-hmm. Or or uh, the one other space where uh, the IoT had really really helped is your baby monitoring cameras. Mm-hmm. So if, you a, if you have a small baby who's like a toddler and they, they are at home and they are sleeping and on. Uh, they might have disturbed sleep or they might just get up and they might just fall off. And these cameras actually can detect that and send you information on your camera, on your on your app. Uh, so that that baby monitoring and, and your uh, basic, uh, you, if you look at uh, one other area where uh, the automations have, uh, like at least at least the improvements are coming in quite very well, is your CC cameras. Mm-hmm. Looks like your cameras, what we call them as. And you, typically, if you see in India, Almost everyone now started installing that on, uh, like in their house or around their houses to capture something. Right? Uh, the biggest innovation is coming in where once you install all these cameras, how do you make it a connected device? For example, mm-hmm. if, I, if I go and talk to my Google Home or an Alexa and tell it, hey, can you tell me on camera if you see anyone moving around? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At this point, uh, nobody has done it. And that is where the majority of the people are moving towards is saying that mm-hmm. what if if it collects enough images, processes those images, and identifies who are your people, that is your own family, which they which it could send, which it could see every single day, right? And, and then once probably it'll ask you, are these people you know? And you mm-hmm. say, yeah, they are the, all these people I know. And anyone mm-hmm. coming in you, right? It could automatically like the camera will take a picture and it can immediately say that a new intruder, intruder uh, detection. And then, and then suddenly your Google Home will say that, hey, we have, we have seen someone coming into your gate. Just take a look at it. Mm-hmm. So, so the, the, the innovations could be many. Uh, the, there are, all these innovations are coming into the picture. And what is important is that, uh, how do you get yourself data? Uh, mm-hmm. It's not about this applicability of it, but uh, it's more into how do you read the data? How do you uh, like process the data? How do you ensure that uh, the data is very, very valuable when you are uh, processing it? And these are mm-hmm. the three uh, most important things. Real-time data processing is what a majority of the people are getting into. And mm-hmm. big data or uh, the big data is what they call it. Big data is nothing but uh, huge amounts of data, like gigabytes, terabytes of data. And then you start uh, like, uh, like uh, processing the data, mining the data, understanding it. So that is where the applicabilities are coming in. So the sensors and all that innovation will continue, but hardware innovation at some point would uh, come to uh, a plateau, right? Mm-hmm. And that is where your software will take it by applicability. What I call it is applicability is right? you have your baseline hardware and multiple sensors and all, but if you see the applicability of it is very, very restrictive. Only the big company industries come into the picture or they are very small time people who are doing it. But if you really want to make a uh, good living out of it or good use case out of it, right? Like the applicability part of it is like has huge playbook for it. And that is where majority of the people can start looking into. And all this IoT stack, what we call them as, has uh, lots of insights into it. Uh, to, to, to just give you uh, an easy start for this, AWS as uh, AWS is Amazon Web Services, has something called as an IoT core. Mm-hmm. It's like a self help tool which uh, helps anyone to put any IoT devices. You really don't have to know IoT. You can actually reach out to this or something like a Google Cloud platform also has an IoT core stack. Like your Google Cloud platform, your Amazon Web Services, your Azure services, all of them have these uh, platforms which which understands how to read the data from an IoT device and actually place it over there. So that for people who want to build applicabilities, right? Now that is like applicability is nothing but your apps or your uh, tools on top of it. So you, even those are out of the box right now. A majority of the people are looking towards that one because that gives you a playbook or an area where you can build multiple apps together. Got it. So like, like you mentioned, right? So IoT is basically devices which are sending streams of data um, um, to a central processor. Um, now you have these doorbells and uh, you know all these CCTV cameras who are sending streams of video data as well. Okay. Um, so these are different kinds of data which is being sent. So is there going to be any sort of limitation in, um, you know, the kind of data which devices are going to send? 
Yeah, hi. Well, I, I think I saw a question on the chat, by the way. So, uh, what is the point of coding? Uh, someone asked, mm -hmm. uh, asked to us. Mm -hmm. Should we answer that one? Yeah, you can tell the point of coding in IoT. Huh. Uh, so, as we we both are discussing, right? Uh, the point of coding is that it's it's for, it's uh, see uh, where do you want to put? You want to build applicability that is your app that is your topmost layer that is where majority of the people are understanding what you're building that is that is the point of coding probably you would start from there rather not starting at the lowest level because for you to go to the lowest level right you have to understand the entire perimeter of what is hardware how do you connect it uh, how do i process it and all but if, if you just take one level above it it means that you started getting some amount of information whether it's relevant or irrelevant but your point of coding is from uh, top to bottom in this case. Bottom to top, you can definitely go, but for that, you would require to uh, uh, go through, uh, like understand hardware, understand software, understand like something like a machine learning, assembly languages, so on and so forth. And then, because then it makes more sense to have that point of coding. But I would always say you start at the topmost layer, that is your uh, applicability or apps, what you build on top, and then, then you go bottom down. When you're starting now, you start at the top, but after so, then you can go dig deep as and when your uh, like academics are going high, you can actually go dig deep. Got it. Yeah, I think I think coming back to the question, right? So, is there any limitations in the kind of streams of data which uh, devices can send right now? Limitations are, I mean. Uh, Again, right? Uh, the devices can send information 24 by 7. So when we actually calibrated it, or the first time when we uh, put the applicability over there, right? We typically send to uh, make it at a certain interval, a certain frequency, rather than just leaving it for the devices uh, to be uh, like sent 24, uh, like 24 by 7. Uh, so that is one of the things. The limitations are in terms of uh, the usage. Uh, what is the primary usage of these sensors? Is the limitation for it. For example, mm -hmm. if, I'm, if I'm looking at proximity center, mm -hmm. sensor, it's only uh, the only thing what it could do is proximity. That's it. So I'm mm -hmm. limiting it only for proximity. That's mm -hmm. the very fact that your smartwatches are having multiple different sensors. For mm -hmm. example, if a smartwatch is saying that I have an SP, SPO2 sensor, I have a pulse oximeter, I have a pedometer, I have a gyroscope, I have like a, a GPS navigation. There are five different sensors which are getting in. Mm -hmm. One watch. So I think that is the, the that is the biggest limitation now, mm. because I need to have all the five uh, sensors in my watch. Automatically, mm -hmm. my weight of my watch is going higher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, so that, that is the limitation right now. So there is no one like mm -hmm. who's trying to uh, come up, or, or, or probably uh, the limitations are more towards uh, what kind of a sensor it is, or what kind of device it is, and what is mm -hmm. the Primary applicability for it. So there is not, like, there is nothing like a generic applicability. I can just put place one sensor and do everything. Uh, I think that is not that is probably the limitation at this point. In time. Got it. Awesome. As per my as per my knowledge, by the way, <laughs> yes. I, I'm not an industry standard, but at least mm -hmm. what I feel is that uh, mm -hmm. the moment I, I look at any, I'm, I'm taking smartwatches because that is now predominantly mm -hmm. the, the one of the highest selling uh, device. Highest selling uh, IoT devices in India is smartwatches, by the way. Mm -hmm. There are about 25 to 30 new brands which started just in one year of time. Mm -hmm. And they, they're clocking almost like 5 to 10 million customers every single month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's about 50 lakhs to 1 crore customer every single month is what they're clocking at this point. Mm -hmm. So that, that is the reason I'm going back to that one. And uh, the limitation, what I saw is that uh, the more the sensors, uh, the mm -hmm. higher the rating. So yeah. that is definitely it's a limitation. So there is nothing, there is always a scope for uh, reducing that and probably using sensors for multi-purpose. I'm not sure if the hardware allows it, but um, if the possibility or, or probably uh, the probability would be high. Got it. Yeah. I think Ram, I think, I think just one last question, uh, you know, for today. Uh, before we wrap up. So I think a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, or a concept which is very popular right now is uh, smart cities. So smart yeah. cities around the world, every city is becoming smart. So so what do you think, um, you know, IoT will sort of play a role in, uh, in, in like a city being smart? 
I think uh, drones would be the biggest thing. <laughs> oh. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, like your like your governance uh, using drones for your governance, which I think Delhi government kind of started and then they just like mm-hmm. uh, couldn't do it because of some uh, FCA like uh, or uh, this regulation from uh, uh, the aviation industry. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, there are people who are trying outside India, and, like uh, in other countries or also in India. Uh, drones for your governance is, is predominantly used. Uh, mm-hmm. You see, majority of our state governments have moved uh, towards using IoT, specifically using drones, uh, to find out uh, any uh, uh, unlawful things which are happening. And that that's definitely one of the greatest innovations what I could say. Predominantly, we used to be like uh, people going and uh, like uh, what we call it as like uh, the throw of the night, they're going and just uh, like looking for any people who are stressed out and all. Uh, so that is one of the things which which majorly helped. Uh, like uh, I could take uh, Telangana government as one of the example. They have set up something called as a T hub, mm-hmm. uh, which is nothing but uh, an IoT, a smart city uh, initiative. It could it, it, it will be called as K hub if it comes Karnataka. Mm-hmm. Nothing mm-hmm. but uh, a hub where uh, all these cameras, all these uh, what do you say uh, governance things, or all these side, all these different information which you're collecting from your apps. From your cameras, your private cameras, your public cameras, then your sensors and all—all all the data comes and sits in a hub. And mm-hmm. now in this hub, there are multiple different teams which are sitting in. Mm-hmm. It could be a police team, it could be a governance team, it could be a food distribution team. The distribution mm-hmm. supply team has huge use cases for it. For example, uh, during this COVID vaccine uh, transfers, like the, the vaccines were uh, like somewhere made in Pune and then they were sent across India. So this distribution, uh, like companies have uh, actually not only because they, they ha- it has to be refrigerated and sent at particular temperature, it's two, two degrees to eight degrees centigrade. They have used this IoT, by the way. They have used this uh, like temperature controlled uh, uh, machine and that the driver or that logistic company was collecting this data and was sending, sending it to that state government or those central uh, places where they were collecting all this information together. So that is a very, very good uh, governance model. Right? If you look at your governance and also you look at your distribution, mm-hmm. uh, all these things coming together is what your smart city is. It's just not about Wi-Fi connectivity, by the way. It's, it's mm-hmm. also about uh, using RFID tags. Uh, uh-huh. But if we are, we are going towards that one uh, like registration uh, uh, tags for your vehicles, mm-hmm. where, where you will have those RFID-based codes or your QR codes, and when you pass through toll gates or when you when you hit a red signal and you 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 jump a signal, it automatically captures and sends a ticket to your house. And that okay. is currently happening across uh, all the major cities in India. And mm-hmm. that is the smart uh, city initiative where you mm-hmm. want to uh, reduce that human intervention as much as possible and mm-hmm. make governance uh, like much more easier. Mm-hmm. Like uh, you, you don't want to have like uh, every day. If you go to a metro in Bangalore or Delhi on those places, right? You'll have lacks of people who are getting into metro at, in the morning stop. That is between six to ten, right? You'll have lacks. You cannot even imagine uh, the the metro lines which are like go like kilometers uh, into it, right? That is where the smart cities initiative is coming into. Where the majority of them can go on to uh, buy those metro cards, which are again RFID ID based. And it just gets scanned wherever it is, and you don't have to really stand in lines to do that, or use some uh, the, what do you say pay as you go kind of a models. All that is coming via this uh, smart mm-hmm. Got it. So RFID is basically like an identity card, which uh, some sort of an indicator which indicates who you are as a person, right? So so you you take the smart card. So smart mm-hmm. city should come came up with smart card, right? Mm-hmm. You see, they, they have, uh, all smart cities are having this called this thing called a smart card or, or call it call it as a one card. That is your mm-hmm. identity. That is your metro pass. That is your bus pass. That is also your train pass. It could be your uh, what do you say? Uh, you you can also pay bills. You can take your LPG uh, like uh, subscription, whatever, or you can also pay for your gas, your petrol bills when you go to petrol pump. You're only on one card. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Either you can leave it on your uh, car and mm-hmm. use it for your own toll gate. Like, like that is the, the RFID base or uh, RFID based tags are coming into the picture. Either they can take a picture and scan it, or they can use infrared to scan it. They can use multiple different ways to do it. But that is the initiative. Mm-hmm. 
so that you don't have to call, carry those many cards in your pocket. Got it. Yeah. Cool. Awesome, Ram. I think uh, I think it is a great session. I think we're running out of time almost, and uh, just a couple of minutes left. And yeah, I think I think great. I think you know, thank you uh, for taking your time today and uh, on a Sunday and uh, talking to our community. I think it was a great session. It was very informative on IoT and the applications. And uh, I think if we get any questions, uh, you know, like we can answer them over the email. Yeah. But uh, yeah, thanks, yeah. Ram. Thanks for taking your time. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, like. Uh... I uh, really, really uh, appreciate it uh, that you, you have called me in for a, uh, like, um, a session. And I'm happy that there are people who are interested in to learn and get to know more. Thanks. Yeah, so much. thanks. Thanks, Ram. Yeah, bye-bye. Thanks.